Commissioner Gold. Aye. Vice Chair Boyce. Yes. Chair Pash. Aye. Motion carried unanimously. And noticing we turned the recorder on a little late, it is a workshop on November 6, uh, 2019 at 2.02 p.m. All right, projects discussion. Discuss partnership with Port of Brookings Harbor to manage the port's RV park, Ms. Schmelzer. Yes, so the Board of Commissioners had a workshop with the Port Commission last month, this past month, and one of the, we discussed ways that we could work together, and one of the items we discussed was possibly county parks helping the port with the management of the RV park. The board had directed staff to pursue exploring what type, what, what a lease like that would look like, um, what those terms could be, hold-ups, anything um, that might prevent us from having that partnership. Josh uh, from the Parks Director and I did go down and we did meet with the Port Commission and they were receptive to the idea of exploring it further. So Josh put together some thoughts on paper. He shared them with um, the, the Port Commission had established like a little subcommittee to just work on this project. So Josh shared his thoughts with that little subcommittee and they gave us a little feedback on it. Um, Josh did put together just some ideas that he did um, give us for the packet, the meeting packet. And he is here to provide a little PowerPoint on the proposal. And then we do have members of the port subcommittee here um, to discuss the proposal with us to see if maybe we can get a little further on an agreement and come to some terms that both parties would be willing to accept. Josh, would you like to? Go ahead. Josh Hopkins, Curry County Parks Director. Just give me one second here. Well, you, you need that. I can tell you so while, tech savvy. So while Josh is working on that, um, just a reminder. So this is the oceanfront property down at the port where they currently have RVs parked. They operated as an RV park campground. Um, so that's the subject part of the port we're discussing today. Josh, if you would pull that one taller microphone over as well. Thank you. Not a problem. So yeah, this is the beachfront RV park. It is located at the Port of Brookings Harbor. It is right on Sports Haven Beach. I think this is either the only or one of the only RV parks that is directly on a beach in the entire state of Oregon. Uh, it was built late 1960s, I think 68 is when it was actually built. Since that time, it has been a home to numerous tourist activities, very big asset to the Brookings area as a whole and promoting all of the different tourist activities that go along with the town and what the port does. In its current configuration, this is a map that I pulled off the website of what they have. It's a mixture of RV sites that are full hookup. Some of them are really desirable pull-through sites that a lot of the campers, especially the long-term RVers, really enjoy using. And then uh, dry RV sites and tent sites. Currently... Oh. No extra charge. <laughs> Currently, with the campground RV park, the main restroom facility is in disrepair and needs replaced. So they aren't allowing dry RV camping or uh, tent camping on site uh, and only allowing the people that are able to hook up to the septic systems with their uh, standard RVs. With that being said, there is, according to this map, about 163 total campsites. That's important to note because part of the funding for Curry County Parks is through our state RV license fees. We get $700 to $1,000 a year per campsite. That adds to a large amount that we would be getting and expecting back from the state every year for our thing. Our next reporting cycle is in spring for that. We report every two years. So if we were able to get a partnership in place, it's really great on the timing wise for that. So with what we presented to the board down at the Port of Brookings Harbor, the tentative ideas that were kind of put out to them, I did throw a caveat that I hadn't had a chance to review this with our board just because of timing and everything like that was the idea of doing a 30-year lease where the county takes over the operations maintenance and future development of the RV park we retain any of the state RV license fees increase I'm not sure if we're even able to share those types of things just because it's a state program like that 
uh, we would gain, you know, possessions of the RV park property, like the picnic tables and things along those lines. With the breakdown of the payouts, we would be doing a partnership where the county gets 25% of the net proceeds, 65% goes to the port, and 10% goes to repaying an interfund loan from the road department. Since the restroom needs replaced, part of this proposal was that we would do an interfund loan from our road department, which I checked with council. He said it is completely legal for us to do this. Currently, the restroom is estimated around, I believe, 400,000 to get replaced. A part of that estimation has building five additional RV sites to help offset the cost of the restroom. And with that loan, the port itself is looking into doing some sort of loan option through like a bank or a private loan. Uh, there's always grant ways we could try to go about it, but grants aren't just like a private loan. Grants aren't uh, a sure thing, same with private loans. And this frees up our income to debit ratios and everything like that. And we already have the process in place for the county. That's why part of this was important to build a repayment structure of that loan into the thing instead of other monies that have been pulled from the road fund, this actually will be repaid. Uh, after the road fund loan is repaid, we would split that 10%, making for a 70-30 split and do payments quarterly. The net is basically just the actual revenue after the standard operating expenses. So, you know, when you're taking in consideration of your power or trash, that type of stuff, you deduct that, what you've spent from how much you've brought in, and that's where we'd start our deductions for the net. After this information was presented to the port and put onto our packet, their subcommittee had a meeting and they came up with some more information and feedback on that. Part of their feedback is to add in there that the Port Commission has a uh, say and approval of capital improvement projects that the county would be doing. That's understandable. It's still their property. They want to say in this. Uh, additionally, one of the nice things we have working for us on this is we're not having to reinvent the wheel. They already have a lot of these projects mapped out and planned out and master planned in their own process. So we actually have a game plan in place. We'd be able to just kind of pick up where they're at and start pushing those projects and checking things off down the line. Additionally, for their lease term, they're more interested in a 20 year lease that has a 20 year extension built in. For the state RV license fees, it needs to be a minimum of 20 years. In a situation like this, it's kind of different than what we have down at the social security bar where we're looking for a 50 year lease, simply because we're gonna have to invest and in basically develop all the infrastructure for that. We already have infrastructure here. Whether it's a 20 year lease or a 50 year lease, the idea is as long as everyone's doing their jobs and keeping the partnership good and going, it's going to be a forever type of lease. So I'm not as concerned with the 20 year as opposed to a 30 year type of thing, as long as it's long enough to get the state RV license fees. Uh, other things of note, they wanted to add in the fishing pier as a part of it. There's this little fishing pier right here that's right down at the RV park. It's right conjoined to it it kind of makes sense if we're maintaining everything down there to maintain that as well i haven't had a chance to go down and look at the fishing pier but it looks like it probably needs some sort of work here and there or at least there's some maintenance coming up so that's something we'll need to address with the subcommittee and really find out what that type of uh addition would do to this deal and then they wanted to establish default limits that has a predetermined minimum amount of what they're going to get back with the net Basically, the RV park pays off a lot of like their past debts and stuff like that. So if something catastrophic happened and expenses increased greatly and usage decreased, they wanna make sure that we'd be able to adjust our share of the proceeds to make sure they have a baseline that they know they can rely on to pay their bills. So I think it's possible for us to actually come up with a good number for that. Based on the revenues that reported over the last six years, the main type of thing we're looking at that affects large amounts of visitor use is some sort of catastrophic weather event, some sort of wildfire or anything like that. If you look at the profits that they had in the 17-18 year of 574,000 during the Checo Bar fire, it didn't hurt them as bad as you would imagine it would having that going on. I'm sure the 2011 tsunami probably cause port damage and a lot of stuff like that but there's really not a lot we can control when it comes to those things but looking at the six-year average of this I think we should be able to come up with some sort of agreeable minimum amount depending on what they need to make sure that they're able to continue to pay their bills and function the way they need to function so with the six-year average of the last revenues 
and breaking it down, the net average revenue that they've had over the last six years is about 379,000, a little bit more than that. And then with the breakdown, the port would be getting 400 or 247,000 estimated. County parks would be bringing in just a little under 95,000 and repaying that loan from the road fund would be just a little under 38,000. After road fund loan is repaid, we'd split into 70, 30. You'd be looking at 265 for the port, 113 for the county. The money's here for this. One of the nice things for this proposal and this project that we don't have at other things like with uh, Elk River is we have past financials to look at. So we know that even if we're only able to maintain it to where we're keeping up with the historical average, that's still a decent amount of money for everyone to walk home with and keep being able to pay their bills. That being said, the idea behind this is that with a more focused management that specializes in campgrounds, RV parks, that type of thing, and as we're making improvements and upgrades to these facilities, we would be able to increase the revenue while decreasing the expenses, because we're catching up with a lot of the stuff that's been historically maybe not as much of a priority when you're trying to run a port and an RV park. Uh, it is important to note that this isn't a situation where the county is coming in and taking over a broken system. Part of the reason these fees are kind of looking at a 25% to 30% match is because as it stands, the port management of these RV, this RV park is good enough to turn a profit for it. So, you know, we're not white knighting this type of thing. We're just barely coming in, bringing an extra level of expertise to this type of a thing. Uh, so that's a part of it. That's really all I've got for this. If you guys have any questions, we can go over that. Uh, but based on the revenue totals and with the idea of getting the state RV license fees, this seems like a pretty decent deal that should be able to come up with an agreeable situation with. Commissioner Gold. Um, just one question. I want to reiterate this 30, 70% mm -hmm. split is on the net. Yes, that'd be on the net after operational expenses. Part of this agreement is going to be identifying what exactly those operational expenses are so that everyone is clear and everything like that. Okay, is the port eligible for any of this state licensing fees? No, those only go to county park systems. Okay, so that would be our advantage for one of the advantages for us. Yes, over. we have additional funding. Uh, the state RV license fees basically pays for maintenance, upkeep, operational cost of RV parks for specific county purposes type yeah. of thing. So. And being a past port commissioner, I know upkeep of this RV park has been horrible, hard to, hard to keep up, especially the bathrooms. But where are we on the electric posts in the, I remember you were trying, we were trying to update those to higher wattage and so forth. Where are we on I that? I believe their plan is to update those up to allowing for 50 amps. I think they have some 50 amps, 30 amps and uh, 114s or something like that. I forget mm -hmm. what the standard is. And then the rest of them are up to 30 amps, but uh, there are plans. You know, those are the type of upgrades that we would be facilitating with these extra. Okay, because I know the have. big RVs can't even yeah, you end up getting some sort of converter, and then they're not able to run their microwave and coffee pot at the same time. It's good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, we don't want to have that. Yeah. So. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, the lease, is that an auto renew lease or is it a negotiated lease? Uh, as far as what those type of details are at this point, we haven't really gotten into that. Uh, the well, you said it was a 20 and then an additional 20. Yeah, and that was just what came in a couple of days ago from the uh, subcommittee's information, but I haven't had a chance to really okay. check this out. Because I'd be it. wondering, is, is, you know, the is it a negotiated lease for the second 20, or is it an auto renew, with an, you know, it has an option to auto renew or not? My recommendation would be to have it as probably a negotiated lease, just because things change. Uh, and as so, things change, it may change your distribution amounts. Uh, on, your, on your picture of the uh, pier down there, the fishing pier uh, that you showed, um, you, you mentioned that there may be some maintenance. Is there um, anyone here from the port that could maybe fill us in a little bit more on what the maintenance on that is expected? Um, are we like, talking about new pilings or are we just talking about some, some repairs on that? Yes, sir. Don't leave, Josh. Hey, don't leave, Josh. <laughs> My name is Gary Dellinger, port manager. Um, yeah, the. Uh, the fishing pier, as far as I'm aware of, the substructure underneath the steel would need to be recoded. That's what I've seen personally. And then the parking lot has some potholes in it. Okay. It has to be addressed. 
One more question, since you're up there, if you know. Um, um, I heard a number of $400,000 for a bathroom. Are those gold knobs on the toilets? Or, I mean, no. how big is it? Do we have drawings of this bathroom already? Is it showers and everything yeah, else included? There's four showers and, and I think uh, six, uh, three men, three men. Installed. But we're looking at a concrete block building, I'm guessing, yeah. that you can walk it's, in and power wash out if you need to. Yeah, it'd be a drop in. Well, that's what we plan is a drop in, but if, if it goes to the county side of things, we probably pass on the design to the county, but they might want to put it in there. But, okay. but also, those costs also roughly about $10,000 per site to build. So you got 50000 or so building those five sites. So we got the rest of it plus those five Just sites. For me, it seems like 350000 is a lot for, for a bathroom. So, yeah. my opinion. <laughs> all right, that's all I have. Gary? Schmelzer? Gary. Doesn't the bathroom also include washers and dryers, laundry no, facilities? Not, not okay, that was a different no. different nice building then. Yeah, this drop-in restroom is 200, 230000 just by itself. Then okay. you got the site work you got to do. Okay, Commissioner Gold? I know the bathroom, the present bathroom, had been flooded a number of times um, in big surges and so forth. Is there anything that would be done to alleviate that? Well, the plan is to move it back on the back row. Uh-huh. We wanted to put a, like a retaining wall in front of it as well, just okay. extra protection. Commissioner Boyce. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I want to thank two of the Port uh, Commission members for traveling up here second time in a little over two weeks. Much appreciated. Um, Josh, I want to thank you for the work, uh, the insight, uh, Director Smelzer. Um, you know, I might be, <coughs> I'm enthused because one of our toughest jobs is bringing the different parties cities, communities together. And so if we can help, and I think that's the attitude you have, how can we help? How can we make it a mutually beneficial program? And uh, it's just it's just a good day. 2019 marks the year of uh, moving forward with uh, pulling our rural county of 23,000 people closer together. And so I very much, Mr. Chair, support this project, as I see right now. Uh, but we've also been doing similar uh, collective work with the Forest Service, the BLM, and, um, and I think we need to accelerate, accelerate that over time, and I, I believe we are, and I think it's gonna bear fruit for our citizens, and visitors, all the above. So uh, I don't know what the next step is, and did you have something else? Yeah. Well, I, I just wanna mention, we might wanna hear from other members of the yeah. subcommittee too, but um, I do wanna remind you that eventually we are gonna have to add staff. As we take on more campgrounds, we're gonna have to increase the staff in that department. Um, so, you know, it's not that a pure profit, you know, that you see up there. We are going to have to account for some staff needs, especially if we take over Social Security Bar or if we have anything to do with McVeigh Park. Eventually, Josh cannot do it all himself. You so can't let's split just, into two people. <laughs> so let's right. just keep that in mind. The other thing is, I know I have heard a concern about the split, uh, that the county wasn't getting a high enough per percentage. But as Josh had said, keep in mind it's their property. They have the infrastructure in there. They've already done the marketing. They've already established the business. We are basically coming in to manage it, so to speak, and, and clean up some things that, that needed addressing. Josh, I just uh, I want to echo Commissioner Boyce and thank you for your work on this. I know you've kind of really sped this along, and I want to thank the port for working with us on this as well. Um, uh, one more question I have, because you, you're the finger on the pulse of that. Uh, in the county, do you think, I mean, there comes a point where we're going to reach a saturation point in, in tourism, and I'm, I'm hoping we're growing tourism here, and I'm hoping economic development is going to continue to push that, but we're not in, at risk, in your opinion, of saturation of tourism where another campground may suffer because we're going to open up this many more spaces? Uh, no, I wouldn't think that we could build a whole other RV park down in the Greater Brookings area and it's not going to have that big of an effect on some of these campgrounds okay. that are already there just because we have such a need. Slam and Salmon Derby, perfect example, every hotel room was booked and that wasn't even like a peak tourist season. So we've got the numbers of people coming here to support multiple projects like this. Still. Well, this board relies on information, you yeah. know, so that's why, you know, I, I wanted to ask you that. And, I like something that Commissioner Boyce said a while ago, um, mutually beneficial is good words. 
Um, this will, I think, mutually benefit both the Port of Brookings Harbor and the county. And the services that we'll offer campers for the future, I think, is great. So, so you in your in your memo information that you have there, there are three standard questions that we're just kind of looking for direction on. Uh, one was to make sure the board's okay with moving forward with this project. Next, the board will entertain the idea of using an interfund loan for the restroom. And then, you know, where you guys are at with the fee distributions and that stuff, just so we have kind of a painted picture moving forward while we're discussing things with the subcommittee. And we can bring that all back to county council so we can draft up a lease that, you know, is encompassing and doesn't take like 15 versions. Mr. Gold? I really think it's a win-win proposition. I'm not bothered by the split simply because it's net instead of gross. So yeah. I'm good with it. I am, I think as well, uh, you know, like you said, the infrastructure is there. The Port of Brookings Harbor has bore the burden of that. So I'm fine with the split. Uh, my, my larger concern would be, you know, the, the restrooms mm -hmm. and making sure that those contracts all go out to fair bid so that whoever is hired, um, you know, we're going to get the best bang for the county's dollar. As far as the negotiation, you know, I just applaud you, you all for working together and moving this forward so quickly. Commissioner Boyce? A couple things real quick. Uh, you mentioned saturation, and I understand where you're coming from there. You know, you saw the front page of the pilot last week, the uh, fat tire on the beach, mm -hmm. and I had this discussion with Director Smelzer the other day and one other person that's very much involved in visitor promotion. And the concern that some someday there's there's not going to be the need for RVs, I don't think that's a, I really don't think that's a big risk. But with the diversity <coughs> that we can offer the travelers that, that that use Curry County for a destination, i.e. the bicycle on the beach, uh, those folks uh, are affluent and uh, they're coming here for a variety of reasons. And uh, w this all of this helps us be better uh, better set up to uh, accommodate them. So the other question I had real quick, have you had a chance yet to look at the terms of the uh, lo road, road fund reserve repayment? Have you thought much about that? Uh, yeah, I looked at the process that the board designed for that, and I believe this process would be a little bit different because this would be an interfund loan. Uh, county Council could weigh in more on that. So the, the program you're speaking about, Commissioner, is um, when we're borrowing money to a special district. That would not be the case in this situation. What it would be would just be basically department to department. So it would be from road department to parks department. Josh did speak about, did uh, discuss this with the road master and um, he understood that, you know, there'd be a repayment on it. So it's not that it would be a gift or free money. Is that correct? That is correct, but since you brought up, you know, the Roadmaster for various reasons, not in support of any sort of loan that goes out against the road fund, I'll just throw that out there because Commissioner Gold. Is he going to charge interest? I would assume there's interest involved. Okay, in it. good. I would think there should be. That was the main part of my question. Yes, we yeah. understand the terms. Thank you, Mr. Chair. But the, I, I agree with Ms. Schmelzer on this uh, as probably a council. Um, you know, this is something that the, the board controls. Uh, where a district, when you loan money to a district, their board takes over control of. This is something that would main. You know, this this board would maintain control of. So that that's it's just an interdepartmental loan. But I, I fully think you know at a minimum. But the road funds uh, fund is making basically two and a half percent annually right now. So it would have to be in excess of that for it to make it uh, make it worthwhile. So that's all detailed. Okay, work great. Anything else? So let's, um, if, does, do members of the subcommittee have anything to add? <laughs> the only question I have is. Name, please. Sorry. <laughs> For the record. <laughs> Ken Range, Port Commissioner. The only reason or the only question I have is there's going to be a transition period. It isn't going to just switch over one day we're there in the management and the next day you are. So um, just in the, we haven't addressed that. Um, I think before we have another subcommittee meeting that should get addressed in some manner. And then how are you going to handle reservations? So those are the only two items that I have. The rest of it we'll be discussing. Thank you. 
characters. Uh, obviously, there's going to be a part where meeting with them down at the port to find out what their current operational means are for these campgrounds. Again, we've sped this from, you know, I think it was the 16th of October to today that this has been going on, and we haven't had a chance to really sit down with the port and find out what their operational standards and everything that they do at the campground are. Uh, so part of this process moving forward is to identify what, you know, that type of transition period is going to look like, when the county is going to take over, what type of uh, things that we have in place that are kind of similar processes between what we're currently running with our other campgrounds and what, what they're doing and what kind of changes that, you know, we'll bring over. As far as handling online reservations or anything like that, we do have our own online reservation system. Uh, I've looked up your guys' system that you're currently using. It's similar to an extent. Uh, with our online reservation system, <coughs> it would increase what we pay by, I think, $90 a year uh, to add another campground to it. Additionally, our payment processor that we use for that system allows us to add another whole uh, account to that. So I've already looked into that. So when we're looking at doing this transition over, it might be a thing depending on the time of year because I know they do six months in advance uh, reservations. So if they're already starting to book for July and stuff like that, we may keep and use their current system for the first year and then plan that transition later on. Just kind of seems there's the whole mechanical working of it that we need to figure out as we go through this process. We just haven't had a chance to yet. Well, I, <clears throat> I know that if someone logs into Porter Brookings Harbor, <laughs> campsite reservation line that you can slave your URL directly to them so when they click on their button it actually goes to your button yeah and so I know those kind of things that can be can be done easily yeah and that's as simple as you know one of the nice thing is they have all sorts of information about their RV park all written up when I talked to our reservation company about possibly adding them the general thought was oh yeah we could do it in a day because we have the information they just copy it over and everything like that and it just gets integrated into what we already use and you know their click here for reservation button just turns into the URL for our reservation. Uh, so, so I would just urge you know uh, so you know um, I, I believe this board is open to what is comfortable for the committee down there as well as the board for Brookings Harbor uh, Port. So uh, you know I think you have from what I gather here our full support on how you would like to move forward with this with this as expeditiously expeditiously or not um, you know just let us know and we'll we'll try and accommodate you so thank you Gary the port does originally Josh and I were going to come back next week for a meeting I think it was next week or the week after I think it's uh, the 19th was it Tuesday do you want us to um, come down before then to discuss it or wait until then and come back to discuss uh, let, it? I'll let you know. Okay. Let me talk to um, some of my commissioners and find out what they want to do. Okay. Right, right now, I got I got a uh, action item for the uh, RV park lease with the county. So. Okay, great. Um, but if we have another me meeting before that, I'm not sure yet. Okay. But I'll let you know. Okay. Thanks, Gary. You're welcome. All right. Two thirty on the dot. <laughs> All right. Next we have uh, B, which would be opo opioid and addictions, Curry County cultural impacts. Commissioner Boyce. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we have a very distinguished group here today, and you know, if I may, um, I want to mention an uh, incident that happened uh, Monday morning. And that was a family of nine that were killed and uh, ultimately burned just 75 miles southeast of uh, the southeast corner of Arizona in the Sonora province of Mexico. And uh, I think it ties into the discussion we're going to have today, how close that is to America. And there's a lot of facts that still obviously need to come out to what extent the, the Drug cartels were involved, but it was an absolute um, massacre, and I'm still processing it, and I don't know anybody that was involved. Um, but I would, subject your approval, Mr. Chair, like to have a moment of silence. This was three mothers and six children. The two youngest were twins. 
and uh, just died a horrible death. And um, they're almost positive they'll prove that it was in relation to two competing um, cartel groups. So if we could have that moment of silence, Mr. Chair. Thank you. So uh, I just picked names at random. I gave you each. I'll call three out at a time. Um, yeah, you want to adjust the microphone each time you come up. Uh, five to five minutes would be ideal. Up yeah, to okay. ten minutes. We got five minutes. Not set up. We have five. I'm not going to cut them off. I mean, they've all been working hard to get here, so I don't know why we're just going to do five minutes. But um, I, everybody showed, and everybody's interested, and this is very important to the public. So we'll start with Everett Dial, then Mona Chandler, and then uh, Monica Griffin, if we could. Thank you, Everett Dial, DA. So. Um, we didn't, you know, we didn't uh, used to ever see heroin, and uh, I'd say the first, uh, I started in Prineville in 92 as deputy DA, I don't think we ever had a heroin case there. When I first came here in 2005, I don't think we had any heroin cases, around 2010 or maybe even later that they, they started showing up, and we, we have been getting them, and uh, we get maybe one or two a month, uh, uh, not, not more than that. Uh, and. Uh, as far as uh, uh, opiate pills, prescription pills, we, we see that, often we see that in uh, cases where they're somewhat related. We had one case in Brookings where uh, one person had a prescription for opium pills and he went to his friend's trailer and the guy in the trailer ended up hitting him. He, he went there to steal that fellow's opium pills and that fellow ended up hitting him with a rock and stealing his opium, his uh, Oxycontin pills. And so. We see that we had a case where uh, a fellow was in jail, uh, had a very high prescription of uh, opium pills, and he was uh, vomiting them back up to sell them to the other prisoners. Uh, that was before Sheriff Ward's time. Uh, <laughs> but anyways, uh, as, as sheriff, that is. Uh, the, but the drug, it, it, well, it seems that my experience is that uh, in talking to law enforcement folks is that most of the people who use heroin sit around and watch TV, and the the drug that. Uh, has always been the biggest problem in this county and basically in all counties in Oregon uh, has been and continues to be methamphetamine. And so I'm going to just divert a little bit to meth because meth is clearly uh, worse. Uh, maybe it's not worth for, for the individual's health, but it certainly is worse for society. Uh, meth users, they, they eat it, they smoke it. Uh, when you go to the store and you see in the tobacco section they're selling little butane pipes, that's not for tobacco. Uh, that's because to smoke meth, you, you heat it up in a, in a glass pipe. If you don't have a glass pipe, you can break an incandescent bulb and use that glass. Uh, they heat it up hot enough with a butane torch that it starts smoking and they inhale that smoke. Uh, they also inject it. Uh, it's popular uh, conception among meth users that if you uh, inject some with a needle and you have friends with you if you backdrop get a little blood in there with the methamphetamine And you hand the needle to the person next to you when he injects it He'll get a high faster because it's got your blood in it. Of course. That is why a lot of these drug users uh, get HIV and other diseases by uh, sharing needles um, The uh, The meth users uh, I've had them testifying grand jury that they've been awake without any sleep uh, for up to two weeks uh, at a time. Uh, after being awake for three days, uh, they begin to hallucinate because they're dreaming while they're awake. Uh, and they get uh, what's referred to as meth psychosis. People that use meth uh, too much uh, can get what the police call permit tweak where they are, uh, uh, they're men essentially become mentally ill from drug use. And we have people like that in our jail all the time uh, who otherwise would have been okay but for methamphetamine abuse. So uh, meth uh, uh, is terrible. I, uh, it, rots, it rots the teeth. Uh, I've spoken several times. I've been with police and said, uh, well, that person who I know to be a meth user, they, they have nice teeth, and they say they're dentures. Their teeth are gone. And we're uh, relatively young people because meth, uh, meth, heavy meth users will lose their teeth. I'm, I'm rushing. I don't only have five minutes. Uh, That's right, no rush. They can, uh, 
they can die from overdoses. Uh, if they take too much F methamphetamine, they can overheat. I remember I was in Prineville at a motel where the dead guy was completely naked, lying on, a, on the floor, and he had been running from a bathtub of cold water, and he had a chair directly in front of the air conditioning, trying to cool himself down because he'd taken too much and eventually Sorry. died from it. Sure. Um, the, uh, uh, but the other thing about meth users is they, they commit crimes. Uh, I did defense work in Eugene, and I had a gal who'd been a stewardess, got hooked on meth and turned to a life of crime. She was good with computers. She had a program that allowed her to create checks with anybody's uh, check number and name on it. And so she would print up checks and give it to her meth friends to take out and try to cash, committing identity theft. Uh, she would forge driver's licenses, any other kind of legal documents you could think of. She told me, she said, Everett, when you use meth, you just want to commit crime because it sounds like fun. Uh, unlike heroin users that sit at home and, and watch TV uh, until they run out, and then, of course, they, they cause crimes. Uh, the um, the uh, legislature has lowered uh, possession of all drugs to misdemeanors. Uh, we can charge it as a felony if they have a usable amount, if they have a prior felony conviction, or they have two um, other drug convictions. The uh, um, I've heard that that's caused uh, attorney, defense attorneys to tell her, their clients not to go to drug court because all you're going to get is a misdemeanor conviction now. So drug court attendance is to help. Uh, at least that's my understanding. We don't have drug court here. Uh, I'm not sure we would get very far if we tried. The other thing is I'm seeing uh, far less drug cases than we used to get. Uh, mm -hmm. And the sheriff can talk to that. I know that one of the reasons is that uh, a lot of agencies no longer do the NIC test because apparently there's dangers inherent with that's the, that's the instant test of whether or not the, the substance is uh, methamphetamine or heroin or LSD or whatever because there's a dangers now inherent in those tests and so the dope gets uh, sent to the lab and the state lab is uh, backlogged for uh, it takes six months or a year to get the results back so uh, and we're just not seeing as many drug cases as we used to um, and given that so many of them are misdemeanors now uh, if we get uh, if we get a, a drug uh, charge and an assault or a drug charge and, and some other more major crime we tend to go uh, in negotiations and say plea to this and, and sign up for treatment for your drug problem uh, and we'll drop the other one because it's not a misdemeanor. Um, you know heroin obviously people who use heroin uh, can uh, die from it um, but uh, the majority almost all of our identity thefts that we see in this county almost all of our burglaries almost all of those cases uh, the people are meth users and I just wanted to add one last thing about meth I looked up some of the Curry County murders that we've had in the last uh, decade or so and I wanted to just mention those because almost all of them uh, involve methamphetamine so we had Alicia Myers stabbed and bludgeoned an elderly woman to death stole her car and her money and used that money to buy methamphetamine um, she was convicted and got life with parole <coughs> Nathan Williams uh, was convicted of murder and abuse of a corpse. He had methamphetamine with a young woman and strangled her and then raped her uh, and then raped her again after she died. Uh, he used methamphetamine with the victim before the murder. Uh, Gregory Bowen, uh, after he had, he had committed murder in Nevada, he came up here, uh, committed murder and a number of other crimes. Uh, he had used methamphetamine uh, days before and after he murdered another man. Um, Gregory Honshell, uh, he shot and uh, killed his grandparents here in Curry County, stole their car. Uh, he had uh, purchased and used methamphetamine just after he committed the murders. And lastly, a fellow named Billy Jean Pruitt, who was never convicted, but had apparently was being investigated for murdering and torturing a uh, neighbor, uh, killed himself in the desert when he was found by Detective Palicki down at Brookings Police Department. Uh, he had a long history of methamphetamine use. The one uh, murder that uh, I, I prosecuted with Scott Jackson was a fellow named Jude uh, who got convicted of manslaughter. Uh, his is the only one uh, in recent history that did not involve methamphetamine. 
his involved alcohol. Both parties were drunk. And, uh, so, anyways, I know there's an opiate crisis. I don't doubt that. And, uh, uh, but uh, uh, from, from where I sit, uh, methamphetamine is the worst drug, uh, and that uh, really needs our attention. And uh, it's, uh, I don't know, I don't see things get better. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, sir. Mona? You've been in a lot of courtrooms. Thank you. Permission to approach. <laughs> Thank you. So my name is Mona Chandler, and I'm the director of CASA for Curry County. Um, I was hired um, February 14th of 2008 under the county's direction, um, under the auspice of the juvenile, um, uh, the juvenile department. And at that time, um, under the juvenile court, or under the juvenile department, um, I served there for three years. And then um, on the fourth year, I transferred uh, my program under the Douglas County Cost of Program. So I am now currently housed for the last almost seven years under the Douglas County Cost of Program. Um, I am going to speak on the behalf and piggyback off of um, Mr. Dial because the majority of the children that come into care in our county um, is based <coughs> off of methamphetamine. Um, last year, we had 112 children in this county that was in foster care for at least one day, 112. When I started in 2008, there was 75 children in care and three advocates. I currently, to this date, have 23 advocates and serving half of the children that are in foster care currently right now, which is about 70 children. But I wanna go back to the 112 that was in uh, care last year for uh, 2018. That is the highest I have ever seen it. Um, we only have 3,100 children in our county. So you kind of figure out the math on that because that's a lot of kids in care in a very small county. Um, the majority of the petitions that are drawn on the methamphetamine use against the parents are um, based due to neglect and um, some physical abuse, but the neglect is the highest. And when I talk about the neglect, I talk about medical ne neglect, I talk about dental neglect, I talk about food deprivation that these children endure because there's no food in the home. Um, they are um, exposed to criminals that come into their homes, so they're put at risk. Um, so the uh, children that are uh, brought into, the, into care are then um, removed from their homes they're placed either in community foster care or they're placed in um, family foster care. And when I mean community foster care, that could either be a foster family that is within our county. It could also mean that they're placed inside a facility that is outside of our county because we have no resources for these children to go. So normally they are either shipped to Coos Bay um, at Baloney Ranch or that we try to find, they try, DHS Child Welfare tries to find other placements um, within the coos or outlining areas to place these children. Um, as far as the, um, the rapidness of methamphetamine use, the um, outcomes for these kids are um, not always the best outcomes. Um, we, have, we had several children last year that were born um, meth exposed in, in utero. 
and um, I can think of one particular case who the child is was uh, methamphetamine was used during the birth um, after the birth and during the birth you know, prior to the birth and that little guy now has uh, chewing problems um, he has um, mental health problems and um, he is um, having to be uh, seen by several um, uh, different types of doctors and even having to go as far as to Portland to go to see specialists there. So um, what is troubling to me on all levels is, is that we just don't have any resources for these kids here. Not in the sense of foster families, the mental health, we don't have facilities to house these kids if they need to be put into you know, specialty facilities. A fourth of our children that are brought into care are shipped out of this area. So when my advocates have to advocate for them, some of them drive as far as Portland to go see these kids. They're required to do a face-to-face -face once a month and, and then report to the judge on that. And, um, I'd just like to stop at this time and see if you guys have any questions. My two questions at the end, that there's time, Mr. Chair, unless you have questions now. No. Okay. So um, I think what some of the struggles that we have as well is um, funding. As you can see on the back, the challenge is, is that um, our expenses and then versus <coughs> our revenue, 56% of my revenue comes from the county, or excuse me, from the community. And um, there's only me and one other full-time person. I do all the fundraising, all of it. And now in 2020, I'm having to do at least four to five fundraisers instead of my one that I normally do. So 25% um, come from my grants and then 16% come from the government. So um, I, would, I would ask that you guys, um, Come talk to me a little bit more about the need of CASA, where we're at, where we're going, and then go to your legislators and your um, resources at legislatively because we need the support. I mean, the work we do is like none other. It's very finite. We don't, there is no other program like CASA. So we support the children when they come into care and we stay with the child through the life of the case, which could, ha could be up to 22 months. So um, it's not only that, we're involved with their schooling, their, their health, their um, uh, additional services that they are needing to make sure that those don't fall through the, the gaps, um, dealing with um, child welfare and the courts, because the system is very hard to maneuver through. So um, we're the, that one continual voice for the child in court. And <coughs> I think that's about it. All right, thank, thank you, you very much. Ms. Griffith. Griffith. <laughs> Griffin, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Melanie Caldera. I'm with Oasis Shelter Home. Uh, Monica Griffin, I am not sure who this person is. Uh, They're not affiliated with Oasis Shelter Home. Also, I represent Leah CB. She is out of town and asked me to represent her. I am the um, advocacy supervisor for Oasis. I've been with Oasis for almost for five or six years. You lose count when you're living in and around trauma. <laughs> so what I'd like to speak to you when it comes to um, drugs, specific to Oasis Shelter Home and the demographic of our community that we serve, is that we have noticed that being a Oasis Advocacy and Shelter Program, uh, we are working with domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking, uh, all forms of interpersonal violence and when we have clients coming into the shelter or into outreach services, we are not just servicing clients for 
symptoms or reaction or emergencies to domestic violence and to sexual assaults and trafficking. We are servicing them for detoxing from drug addiction, from drug use. We are not allowed to deny access to the shelter if they are using drugs, which poses the next problem uh, of having clients in the shelter using drugs that is prohibited, which means the first three to four days of our clients coming into the shelter, they are detoxing in shelter. There's no counseling for them available, available drug and alcohol counseling, unless they go through Department of Human Services, Child Welfare, any form of Curry Community Health referral process. We have no access to drug and alcohol counseling. We have no access to drug and alcohol rehabilitation, whether that's in-house or out, outreach. We have, we have no access to that. Um, we have also found that these clients don't just come with a problem. They don't just come with a crisis. They have a cluster of crisis. <coughs> um, the cluster effect of Perry County, which I speak of a lot, is the cluster of domestic violence, sexual assault, uh, housing problems, homelessness, drug and alcohol misuse, um, child, uh, child welfare intervention, children are living in foster care, speaking to what Mona says, I 100% back what Mona says. Uh, children are living in foster care, we are having co-advocacy where we are working with child welfare um, in order to facilitate reunification, in order to facilitate a fair chance at getting their children back. But again, we are not just working with victims or survivors of domestic violence. We are working with people that are actively fighting, struggling on a daily basis, homelessness, unemployment, drug use, the, it's a cluster. It is an absolute cluster. So for us to just stand here and focus only on domestic violence and sexual assault in our program would not do our clients any form of justice. Um, because again, it is a cluster. We need assistance. We need help. We don't have any rehabilitation centers here. We don't have a person we can pick up the phone and say, we have a client in shelter that really needs a conversation with you. She needs to understand how to detox. She needs to understand what programs she can go to for help. We have got the domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking part covered. They get a very solid community partner wraparound for that problem, but we are not able to help them with the drug addiction problem, with the drug substance use problem. And you know, the, the sheriff department too has responded to the shelter environment where we have clients in shelter with drugs in shelter. We have the interaction between clients that have been clean for two, three, four months and clients that are coming in that are only going to start detoxing now. So we have a whole bunch of trauma that's going on there, triggering that's going on there. So do you see the cluster that I'm talking to right now? Um, it is not just domestic violence that Oasis Advocacy and Shelter Services. We are really, really uh, servicing all of it. We're trying to figure out homelessness. We're trying to figure out uh, dim, uh, um, substance misuse. We're trying to figure out uh, alcohol misuse. How do we, how do we, where do we send them? How do we go about this? We are sitting with uh, a pr advocacy privilege, which means we are not reporters. We cannot just go to a community partner and say, hey, I need this person you know, I want to report to child welfare that this person is using substances while they have a child in order to get them referred to drug and alcohol programs. We need an avenue, we need a person, we need a rehabilitation center, even if it's a house, something small, something, somewhere, someone. We can reach out to you and say, okay, we need to co-advocate with you. Most partners here <coughs> would recognize that we do actively co advocate with them we do a cluster wraparound for all of our clients and the one person that has been missing the one presence that has been missing with the cluster wraparound the wraparound services we're providing every individual that comes across our board is missing substance use counseling substance use rehabilitation there's nobody there at the community meetings the chip meetings the CAC meetings the social services connect meetings we are all there every single meeting we are all there except there's nobody representing drug and alcohol there is a huge deficit 
um, we, we can take care of the rest of the cluster. But still, how is unemployment going to be solved if they are struggling with that addiction? Um, how is, you know, everything, criminal, criminal law enforcement uh, presence in these people's lives? If you look, I'm going to go right back into neurobiology right now, but if you look at the, the basic ACEs study, one of the adverse experiences is law enforcement presence in your home drug presence in your home, criminal presence in your home. So without addressing that, without addressing a drug misuse in Curry County, we are really not taking care of the whole cluster. We're not taking care of the family and we're looking at intergenerational response to the same cluster. I think I think many will agree with me. It's an intergenerational response. Where we were responding to families, we're now responding to their children for the same problems. And this is something that needs to be addressed. Methamphetamines is Curry County's nightmare right now. It is ours too. Oh, this is advocacy and shelter. It is a nightmare. Um, and without our community partners, I don't know what we'd do. Methamphetamines, it's, 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 an, it's an absolute nightmare. We need help in Curry County with this. I need help to serve anybody that comes in front of us with a methamphetamine, with any form of drug addiction that is a severe, a severe disadvantage to them and they are struggling. These people are struggling. Their behaviors are not socially acceptable. Their behaviors are, you know, keeping law enforcement on their toes, but they are human beings and they are struggling. It's part of the cluster that they are struggling with every day. They need help. We need help. Curry County needs help. That's all I have to say. These are all the words I have to say on this. Um, it was short and sweet, uh, but the cry for help is there. We need a person. We need something, somewhere, somehow to fill this gap. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Caldera, so sorry to have, I don't know what happened on my wires getting crossed. I apologize. <laughs> I'm like, okay, name change. Sheriff Ward. Thank you. Boy, there's been a plethora of uh, information given. So I want to try to stick to the, the reason we're here about the opioid and the addiction issue. A little follow-up on what the DA said about drug cases being down. That's not correct. We haven't sent a lot of our drug cases over to the DA because they won't file on anything unless we have a positive result back from the crime lab or a NIC test. We don't use NIC tests anymore, and that's a street, it's just a little street test thing because of the dangerous drugs that are coming through. And there's a lot of agencies that's gone away from the NIC test because of the, the one drug called fentanyl. Just a little bit of fentanyl is enough to kill everybody in this room and probably everybody in this building. So if my deputy's getting you know, in contact with that, I don't want to face that so we don't do the NIC test. In other words, when we do a, we've done a m many, many cases here recently about drug test cases with our canines that have, have found drugs and everything, we just haven't sent the reports to the DA because the DA will not file on them and send the report back until we get something from the crime lab. And like the DA says, it could be six months to a year before we get that information back. So. And coupled with the fact that uh, our great governor's office basically decriminalized um, the use of possession of controlled substances to fit from uh, felonies down to misdemeanors, they don't even hardly uh, run cases for misdemeanors anymore. So I just wanted to touch bases on that. Uh, or I, Pull something off the internet, I thought, it was, and it was a good read, and I'll only read just a little bit of about it. <coughs> I do have my glasses. <laughs> the National Institute on Drug Abuse, NIDA, regards opioid addiction as a serious public health concern. In 2016, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, reported that 66% 66, 66 of drug overdose deaths were linked to opo opioids. Opioids, also called, also called narcotics, are prescription drugs used to treat chronic pain experiences after an accident or surgery. 
Natural opioids are derived from an opium poppy plant where others are man-made and synthetic. Synthetic heroin and illicit drug. It is also an opo opioid and has a high rate of abuse and resulting in an addiction. Not all of the millions of Americans, men and women, addicted to opioids, but abuse of both illegal and prescription opioids have resulted in a high rate of drug overdoses. Illegal prescription opioids. The opioid heroin is a potent and highly addictive substance. It's potentially, it's potent, potency and ability to cause dependency is owed to the fact that it is made from morphine, a substance found in the opium plant. Doctor prescribed opioids are meant for medical treatment, but misuse and abuse of is often cause of prescription opioid addiction. Persons misuse these medications by taking too many or using them frequently. Frequent or long-term use causes you to develop a tolerance for high addictive drugs. <coughs> Illegal opioids are like heroin and opium. Uh, when you got your prescription opioids are like codeine, morphine, fentanyl, oxycodone, hydrocodone, tramadol, and oxymorphone. All, all those things are, you know, considered possession of controlled substance. And in order to be in possession of a controlled substance, it's, they're not yours or it's an illegal substance. Uh, so most of what we're talking about is like the uh, prescription drugs. We find a lot of people that either steal them or they, they have a, uh, a prescription. They, they claim that they've been stolen. So the doctor will, and they have to have a police report before the doctor will give them some more. So they get more and they get sell and then they get traded for dr um, other drugs or other property, stolen property. And it's just a big cycle. Possession of a controlled substance is abbreviated as PCS and can informally be referred to as drug possession. Possession of a controlled substance in Oregon without a valid prescription or other medical legal authorization is punishable as a felony. It was until they decriminalized it. And like the DA says, if you have a prior felony conviction or more than user amounts, and it's your second offense, you know, they can charge it as a felony. The government need not prove that the actual <coughs> possession, but can provide their case by what is called constructive possession, meaning legal fiction or presumption that an individual has actual control over the controlled substance without necessarily having physical control over it. It is unlawful for any person to manufacture or deliver a controlled substance. Any person who violates this subsection is with respect to is a, consoles, a controlled substance is a Schedule One, is a Class A felony. Controlled substance of, in a Schedule Two is a Class B felony. A controlled substance in Schedule Three is guilty of a Class C felony. A controlled substance in a Schedule Four is a Class B misdemeanor and a controlled substance in a Schedule 5 is a Class C misdemeanor. But like I said, you know, with it being decriminalized, um, we don't have a lot of teeth. And I don't know if you guys were watching the news last night. I was watching where, I think it was in Ohio, did the same thing, and they let out 400 uh, people who have who were convicted of felony um, drug, drug possession. Yep. They decriminalized down to misdemeanor, and they all got out and they're gonna be doing more. And so if we don't have the teeth to do something like this, they're not, the problem's not gonna go away. And yeah, we, we do see a lot more heroin problems in, in Curry County. Methamphetamine is the biggest uh, problem, but heroin is on a, on a steep rise. So that's about all I got for you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sheriff. Uh, Greg Gill, Connie Hunter, and then Beth Barker, Hidalgo. Say your name and uh, your occupation, if you would. Yeah, my name is Greg Gill. I'm uh, the clinical supervisor for Curry Community Health. Um, I guess one of the things that I brought to Curry Community <coughs> Health, I've been here now for about six, seven months, um, is working the opiate epidemic. You know, so it's been, um, I've been working with it for about 15 years. Um, I've worked in the downtown Portland area, worked out in Gresham. Um, 
was actually the director of Allied Health over in Medford for five years and then came here to Prairie Community Health. Um, there's definitely is a big rise. You know, I think that we saw a lot of it about five, six years ago with um, safe prescribing limits of opiates. Uh, you know, the, the opiate addict is not what people envision anymore. You know, it used to be a guy in the back alleyway that's got the needles and all of this. You know, what I've seen over the last eight, ten years is it's the 20-something year olds. And they're getting a hold of the pills in mom and dad's cupboards. They're finding it from their friends. They're finding it in the schools. And it's everywhere. So we see a lot of people, a lot of young people coming into treatment that aren't even aware of what the opiate is. You know, people will take it for a little while, they'll go through the withdrawal symptoms and not even know that they're going through withdrawal symptoms. Um, there is a lot of overdose from it. You know, people aren't aware that it's a central nervous system depressant. And what that means is, you know, you take some of the pills, you go out and you party one night with your friends and you're drinking. So now you've got two central nervous system depressants. They think that they're tired or just passing out and the person just suffocates in their sleep. They quit breathing. Um, Sheriff talked about uh, fentanyl. We're seeing a huge rise in that. We saw fentanyl coming into the heroin probably about eight years ago. Didn't see it in the valley until about five years ago. And I've talked to people here in Curry uh, County that are seeing it in the, the heroin now. You know, fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know how you want to look at it, but they can smell it when they start cooking it down. They can smell the fentanyl in it. And I can't blame a sheriff that wouldn't want to you know, touch the the product in fear of you know dying from it because it is a very potent thing. Um, the opiate epidemic, you know, a lot of there's a lot of misconceptions out of that as well too. Um, when I was the director over at, at uh, in the valley, you know, we dealt with two different medications there. We dealt with a Schedule II narcotic, which is methadone, and a Schedule III narcotic, which is Suboxone, buprenorphine. Uh, buprenorphine is on the rise. It's a great medication. It has what's called a ceiling effect on it that a person cannot overdose. <coughs> so safe prescribing, they say, is between 2 and 32 milligrams. Very few people ever go on 32 milligrams um, because of the ceiling effect of it. And people stabilize relatively quickly on it. Um, it's, it's a wonderful medication. We use it at Kermit Curry Community Health. Um, I saw a gal one time come in just crying in tears and I stopped and I go, what's going on? What happened? She told me about taking two weeks worth of medication overnight, just trying to get that high off of it. It would last about five to ten minutes. But the nice thing was that she was there and able to cry the next day about it. You know, she didn't die from it. Um, Curry Community Health, since I've come here, um, we've really geared up and we're really looking to help those people that are on the streets that are using the opiates, whether it's the pills, um, the heroin that's out there. We've got a great medical director, Dr. Whipple. Um, he has uh, got his X waiver now. We've got two nurse practitioners that. We'll be getting their X waiver soon, so we're really gearing up for that. Uh, typical process of somebody coming into our care would be calling up or you know, community partner getting in touch with us. We do a quick screening over the phone. We like to see them face to face, talk to them about their addiction, um, and then we'll do an assessment with them and get them in to see the doctor. Depending on their usage, you know, an IV user will try to get into treatment fairly quick. I had one gal; she was pregnant, a young gal that came in. We got her on the medication the same day got her stable in no time so the child had a chance to. Um, the opiate epidemic is very real. Not to take away from the methamphetamine, absolutely, it's probably the worst thing here in the county, but I see enough of the opiates to raise some concern for sure in a community as small as what this is. Um, I'm just here to do my part and whatever we can do at Curry Community Health. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gill. I have a question, Greg, real sure. quick. Um, when Melanie was talking, she was talking about <coughs> substance use represent, representation is missing in the cluster. Mm -hmm. Does your organization partner with her, participate in that group? I know you're relatively new, but... There, there is one, a couple community meetings that I haven't been able to make. Um, we've been understaffed and really pushing hard to get people on staff. There is a meeting tomorrow that I'll be attending. And So I do attend some of them when I'm able to, um, but we're always available. I'll give you a card before we leave here today. Pick up the phone. Okay. Okay. Thank you. We're gonna do questions up. Cluster lady.
thanks for having this uh, special day, this workshop. Microphone. Yeah, I don't poke myself in the eye with that one. <clears throat> I'm Connie Hunter, and I'm a proud resident of South Curry County. And I'm a person with lived experience. At least that was the title that they gave me when I applied to participate on the Oregon Opioid Taper Guidelines Task Force. The state of Oregon, that particular task force uh, was particular to changing the guidelines and helping clinicians uh, make better decisions and uh, individual people with uh, opioid issues to make better descriptions, <coughs> pardon me, decisions. We are in the midst of a nationwide push to treat chronic pain and address out of control opioid prescribing. Many providers, including the Veterans Administration, were or are ill prepared to address the resulting bad perfect storm from over prescribing opioids. The CDC recently published recommendations for the treatment of chronic pain, specifically highlighting behavioral treatment as an approach that should be tried even before opioids are prescribed. The state of Oregon Health Authority work in developing a number of opioid prescribing and taper guidelines came as we witnessed a devastating public health crisis that has ruined individual lives, destroyed families, and ripped through communities. Prescribers did not have the tools that they needed to arm themselves with the skills needed to offer clients evidence-based behavioral interventions to help them live healthy and productive lives. In an effort to change the conversation on pain management and improve patient safety, the Oregon Health Authority convened experts and community members from across the state to develop clinical guidelines on opioid prescribing and tapering. And that's the uh, task force that I sat on. Statewide guidelines are now available for chronic pain, acute pain, dentists and pregnant women, and on completion of the work of the Oregon Opioid Ta Taper Guideline Task Force work, the new tapering guidelines will be published soon, uh, probably before 2020. The resulting guidelines from the Opioid Taper Task Force supplement the opioid prescribing guidelines for chronic pain to help patients and providers approach <coughs> opioid tapering with best practices in mind. I'm gonna try and s scoot ahead a little bit, um, but it took, a, it took us about five mo months to do that work. Um, I, w I was on a task force with people in, in mental health field, in the healthcare field, uh, top administrators, uh, amazing people, and, uh, and I had lived experience. <coughs> uh, one of the things, one of the reasons that I decided I really wanted to be on that task force, well, two of them, uh, one had to do with my own uh, experience and, and knowing that back in the day when they were, uh, I was prescribed opioids for 10 years, um, the guidelines didn't exist and it was kind of a free for all. But also uh, the VA uh, decided in about February of last year to cut opioid prescriptions or pain medications for veterans in half. No tapering, no support, no choice in the matter, and no decision as to whether they should even be tapered to begin with. These automatic med cuts turned my cell phone into a crisis line. Pretty sure that the same thing occurred across the country as I have over 2,000 veteran and family members' social media contacts, and many have reported this issue and horrible outcomes, including family members uh, discussing recent suicides of their veteran family member tied to the egregious cuts in pain medications without tapering and guidelines that are meant to provide a way through the maze of changed brain chemistry of a prescribed side effect of chemical dependency. In other words, when you get a prescription for Oxycontin, they didn't bother, they didn't have informed consent. They would say, we're gonna give you this, it'll help you with your pain and we'll figure out 
uh, you know, how long you have to take this. They didn't say you're going to get a chemical dependency. And if you're on it for 10 years, it's going to change your brain chemistry. Well, that's the reality of it. Um, the change in the brain that adds to the difficulty in tapering off medication, detoxing in increments, are of concern. The definition of substance use disorder. A substance use disorder, also known as drug use disorder, is a medical condition in which the use of one or more substances leads to clinically significant impairment or distress. And of course, previous guidelines or a lack of guidelines were never trauma-informed. And when it comes to veterans, any treatment should be trauma-informed. These cuts that were done by the VA in response to previous over-medicating that the VA had done in the past. For example, and I'm gonna use uh, an example that hits close to home, because if I can put a face on it, um, I think it's more meaningful. And I'm gonna talk about retired Navy Chief Leslie Sue McConaughey Piotrowski. I'm gonna call her my cousin. My family, uh, three veterans in Ohio, moved their families to Arizona together. And so uh, the McConaughey family was one of those families. My father was a World War II veteran, and uh, her father was, a, uh, Leslie, my cousin, her father was a Silver Star winner who uh, in World War II was in the Army and relieved a concentration camp. So when she went into the Navy, it was a, it was a big deal because my dad was Navy. After serving in the U.S. Navy for 20 years, and working at the Pentagon on 9-11, where she lost many friends and co-workers and narrowly escaped being injured herself, she was in a car accident and suffered a broken neck. Her resulting condition was a dangerous combination of PTSD and severe pain issues. The deadly cocktail of medications that she was prescribed and an autopsy showed that Navy Chief Leslie had not uh, taken more than her prescription. Um, but she was labeled a chief's chief by the men and women who served with her and under her. Leslie provided me with information that my family needed when my nephew Kyle was killed in Iraq when she worked at the Pentagon. Um, and she, at that time, served as a liaison between various branches of the services at the Pentagon. Um, she went to bed one night and never woke up and left two teenage sons over prescribing kills. <clears throat> because I had lived experience with 10 years of legally prescribed Oxycontin uh, pain management for a C5, C6 neck injury, which resulted in a surgical fusion, and the L5S1 discectomy, I applied to be on the task force and I was accepted. Uh, I did the call in, the meetings were important. My lived experience had taken place, uh, like I said, at a time when guidelines were all over the place. Um, but through the process, uh, the resulting guidelines provide a framework for clinicians and patients looking to develop their own taper plans. You're taking this much and you want to go off of that medication a little at a time and according to what your own needs are. Um, but the, the <clears throat> patients looking to develop their own taper plans as well as starting a starting point for dialogue between patient and provider. A patient's input matters. When the VA cut prescriptions without even letting that veteran know that that was going to happen until it did and providing no taper opportunity um, was inhumane, in my opinion. Um, but the legacy of these new guidelines is that a patient's input matters. There are times while sitting on this task force, I wondered if I had been heard if my suggestions were worthwhile. And I used to stew on that. I'd go spend three hours in the meeting and wonder, did they even hear me? I read between two and four hours per day to try and catch up on the technical information that was shared to help inform the task force efforts. The next draft of the guidelines would come out, we would have changes that reflected that I had been heard that my own difficult experience and the experiences of my family in the local veterans community and across the country were heard. <clears throat> that maybe someone we loved next time won't suffer or die in vain as we carry forward the truths of their and our own lived experience. Veterans Day is November 11th. 
This is my gift and my promise to the 15 veterans in Curry County who confided their struggles with me regarding the Veterans Administration policy to overcorrect their previous error of over prescribing medication and in loving memory of cousin Leslie and for all those whose families lost veterans because of pain management issues and lack of trauma informed care and I'm going to ask for a second moment of silence and I need everyone's help to correct this course let's start with a moment of silence for all those who have lost lives from opioid issues Thank you. We are so blessed to have Will Wasson, our VA South Coast Suicide Prevention Coordinator who is enlightened and devout in his service to veterans as we address the bad perfect storms that arise from complex problems such as the opioid crisis. It is up to the people like Will to carry this burden daily. The greatest truth that our VA catchment area can rely on rests in the integrity of individuals who do amazing work in spite of an underfunded system. We can say the same thing about our local behavioral health provider, Curry Community Health. As uh, Curry County Commissioner Court Boyce can attest as he was there when I made a request of Senator Wyden, as soon as those Oregon guidelines are published, that I will personally provide Senator Wyden a copy of those guidelines to present to the VA Secretary Wilkie. Commissioner Boyce, will you help me with this effort? I already know the answer to that. <laughs> In following the publication of those guidelines, <clears throat> that do not shame the person who needs pain management, but provides dignity and respect that an individual deserves, that the process of tapering only when needed and with the emphasis on the patient's timing while providing support is, thank you, <laughs> I so appreciate you, <laughs> mm -hmm. providing support that is customized for the individual. I'm asking each of you to be advocates regarding this. I know even before I asked this of Commissioner Chris Pash to advocate at NACO for the VA to adopt similar humane opioid tapering guide guidelines that he's already on it. I know that. Beyond that, because of the number of veterans who are in Curry County and our South Catchment area, would the Curry County Board of Commissioners consider writing a letter of solidarity to the VA to let them know that these new guidelines are available and suggest adopting similar guidelines? I'm not going to go on much longer, but I can tell you <coughs> the experience that I had being on that task force did me a huge favor. I remember distinctly that I was not only feeling empowered to help provide input, but also liberated because I was given information that relieved my own guilty feelings of the side effect of a faulty drug. Words such as drug addiction, which creates a drug addict, are really victim shaming. Back when I was prescribed Oxycontin, it was not with informed consent. No one told me I would receive pain relief and a chemical dependency. Um, I have a number of uh, attachments. I'm not going to get into too much more, but uh, I encourage people to consider <coughs> sitting on the Curry Community Health Behavioral Health Advisory Board, and then uh, we need more volunteers and community stakeholders' participation in these quarterly meetings um, to provide uh, direction and assessment of the work that they're doing. Um, I do have applications for mm -hmm. uh, that opportunity if anybody is interested, and I have a full package of information to anybody in the audience that would like what I've shared today. Thank you for having Thank me. Thank you. Thanks, Connie. Beth? I'm Beth Barker Hidalgo, the director of the Curry Homeless Coalition, and um, I just want to thank commissioners and the chair for this opportunity to share information. 
um, with you about how our community is impacted by illicit drug abuse, particularly opioid misuse and overall substance use disorder um, from the lens of the Curry Homeless Coalition. Um, I was fortunate enough to receive a scholarship from Advanced Health to attend the OPAT, which is Opioid Pain Alternative Treatment Conference in May of this year. Um, I learned a great deal about treatment opportunities, reducing <coughs> the stigma associated with substance abuse, misuse, um, whether it's illegal substances, prescription medication, or medicated, um, medication assisted treatment. Um, you have handouts there. There's a handout titled Opioids in Curry County and South Coast Prescription Drug Overdose Prevention Grant Report, which were both produced by Kate Frame um, with Advanced Health. Um, I'm not taking any credit for that. That's her work. <laughs> um, and there's also a white paper, Opioids in the EMS Response. That's not a local um, lens, but I just thought might might be a little bit of a different twist on on the perspective of from uh, first responders um, so the first thing i'd want to point out in the grant report is the lack of information regarding curry county um, it's an unfortunate and directly related to lack of data collection data sharing and reporting at the local and regional level so um, one of the reasons that we don't have the data collection that has been given by medical providers here in Curry County is that um, we're such a small community that if we report these things, then it won't remain private. And I would argue, and I'm going to push back really hard on that because um, I know of a recent incident of a young person that we've been working with for nearly a year now that presented at our emergency room here in Curry County and presented as an opioid um, heroin overdose suicide attempt. And when the CCO received the documentation from the ER visit, it said ER visit. There was zero information on why this person was presented at the ER. And so it's impossible for their provider to follow up appropriately with this person, whether it be Curry Community Health or any other provider in the community. Um, to be able to address the, <coughs> the suicidality, to address the drug misuse. So that's a, a huge barrier for us addressing the issues that we have in Curry County, whether it's heroin or methamphetamines or alcohol abuse. It, it, we gotta get out of that concept that we can't talk about these things because we might, we might violate somebody's privacy. Meanwhile, we have people that are, um, that are overdosing in our community. Um, and so I think a better pathway for us would be to look into the Oregon Health Authority's recommendation, which is to work collaboratively at that local level. Sit down and figure out how can we protect people's privacy and gather that d important data and report it up to the state. Because if you go to the OPA dashboard right now that's maintained by Oregon Health Authority, it looks as though Curry County doesn't have a problem and it's because of the lack of data. So if we don't have a problem, we can't go after the grant funding to produce the treatment centers to, to support any kind of efforts that we might want to take on to address the issues. So first of all, we've got to collect and, and report the data. Um, the report goes on to state that Curry overdose death and hospitalization rate data is suppressed. Um, so again, that's just backing up what I was just saying. Um, the final segment of the report discusses the development of an interdisciplinary team in Curry County, and that was headed up by Beth Beasley at Curry Community Health, the public health prevention coordinator. Um, it involved the Brookings Alliance on Prevention. There was representation from law enforcement, city officials, school-based health center staff, a member of the Youth Advisory Council, a parent, service club member, a business owner, a retired judge, and a school administrator. I'd like to know if that council still exists. If so, what, when do they meet? What are they doing? Are we working on moving the needle in Curry County? And, and it should also be countywide. It should not just be happening in Brookings. We have an issue countywide. We should be looking at it from a countywide lens. So um, according to the 2018 Curry Community Health assessment, the morbidity and mortality associated with inappropriate use of opiate drugs such as codeine, oxycodone, morphine, 
and methadone have a negative impact on the health of the community overall. Uh, not just the, the individuals that are having an issue, but it's our community overall. Um, prescribing patterns for Curry residents on Medicare for 2013 to 14 show higher rates of opioid prescriptions than state and national trends. Um, among the youth, 25.5% of 11th graders in Curry County say that it would be either easy or very easy to get prescription drugs not prescribed to them in 2017's Healthy Teens Survey. Um, you know, we heard earlier about how kids can get a hold of medication, their parents, um, grandparents, friends. Um, when when a, a, a teen comes to your home and asks to use your bathroom, make sure there's nothing in that medicine cabinet that's going to walk out the door when they leave. Um, <coughs> protect your medication if you have it. Protect the kids. Um, I'm requesting the Board of Commissioners um, support and urge outreach to Oregon Health Authority, Curry County providers, and CCOs to develop a data collection, analysis, and reporting system. OHSU may be an option for assistance with a project of this magnitude, importance, and impact. Um, maybe we can get an intern assigned to the county to, to work on this. Um, since opening the Resource Center, I've learned anecdotally of a countywide trend where an unhoused people are targeted to move illegal drugs into our community. Drug dealers know that many people who have experienced what is defined as chronic homelessness often have trimorbidity, which means they <coughs> suffer from mental illness, substance use disorder, and homelessness. This makes these people easy targets to mule drugs into our communities. The high rate of incarceration amongst homeless people contributes to high fuse frequent user system engagement scores, resulting in higher costs to the community overall. Our Sheriff's Department houses many people who suffer from mental illness and our substance use disorder, which is not effectively treated in jail, nor should jail staff be expected to, to effectively treat people with substance use disor disorder and or mental illness. Curry County would benefit tremendously from the addition of a local residential treatment facility. Oxford House is a proven approach to treatment for substance use disorder. As a CASA in Curry County have witnessed the barrier to treatment due to the need to leave their home community. Leaving their home community for treatment prevents a huge barrier to achieving sobriety for many people in Curry County. There are evidence-based programs providing residential treatment we could and should explore if we're serious about helping our community heal from substance use disorder. I'll share with you some data points we've collected. I'm kind of shifting gears just so that you can get an idea of who we're serving across the street. Um, it's just a little snapshot. We have seen, as of today, I put 166 clients. I entered a new one right before I came over here. So we have 167 clients in our database, 275 individual visits to the resource center for a variety of services, showers, food, clothing. Uh, peer support, just a place to hang out where they're welcome. Um, we've logged 56 showers. We've provided more, but we didn't begin logging the data until about June, July. Uh, we've helped 13 households receive homeless prevention funds to remain housed or for over the threshold assistance, totaling over $15,000. 38% um, of our clients served our house. They're, we're not just serving <coughs> homeless people. Um, they're experiencing extreme poverty and or rent burdened. And in other words, they're spending between 50 to 80% of their income on housing. So don't have funds to meet all their needs. That's just that cluster of crisis and trauma that Melanie was talking about. And that weighs so heavily on people that they tend to um, turn to anything that will numb the pain that they're feeling from just having to live in the crisis of poverty day after day. We're hosting three AA meetings per week. We welcome additional opportunities to support increased access to programs offering support for people in recovery. Um, we recently began offering mail services to folks who have nowhere to receive <coughs> income mail. People can use general delivery at the post office for some mail correspondence, but vital service providers like Public Utilities Commission Lifeline Sales Services require a physical mailing address. And we're now contracted with ORCA, Oregon Coast Community Action, to be the coordinators in Curry County for the point in time count, the annual homeless census, and HUD's coordinated entry assessment program. Coordinated entry assessments are now the pathway to housing and services by community action agencies across the country. 
um, short of developing low barrier integrated services, transitional housing for our unhoused residents, the Curry County Homeless Coalition provides services designed to respond to gaps in services as best we can. The reality is the longer the people remain unhoused, the higher the likelihood they will turn to alcohol or illicit drugs to anesthetize the cold, lonely, stigmatized, and isolated life they are living. It's a focus to support capacity building in Curry County that would provide a high level of case management, peer support, and navigation services for unhoused people. We believe the pursuit of increased human capital is a necessary <coughs> step before we tackle the issue of increasing per permanent supportive or transitional housing in Curry County. To that end, Advanced Health has begun recruitment for traditional health workers and peer support specialists. And CCO 2.0 requires that these positions be filled in order to be better able to manage the needs of people experiencing extreme poverty, homelessness, and substance use disorder and mental illness. And that's all I have. Need. Thank you. Thanks. Mr. Chair, we'll try and speed it up. You want to take I a just want to say one thing real quick. We're going to take a real quick uh, seven minute break. How about we come back at 345? Let everybody stretch for a minute. place to fine-tune it, build it, launch it. If you're only your best when you can play more than you work, if inspiration comes from the outside, you belong in Curry County, the westernmost point of the land you love and the edge between familiar and uncharted. Break the pattern. Be where the airports are as close as the beaches and industry and recreation never cease to amaze. Dock, dive, and dine in a single day and never lose your connection. This is the threshold of the West. Live where you can do you and do it well at the farthest point from ordinary. Curry County living on the edge. One of the things I really appreciate about our entire region is that we embrace who we are, and I think that's what unifies us. Once the timber and fishing industries collapsed, it took us a long time to get back on our feet. People didn't quite grasp the idea that once these jobs left, they weren't going to get other family wage jobs, and it crippled us. Things were getting really dire. So we just saw that this was an opportunity to maybe look at that public land a little differently and how it could bring more dollars into our region. The Wild Rivers Coast is so unique because there are more wild and scenic rivers here than anywhere else in the lower 48 states. The scenic beauty is just amazing. There's so many different places to go from the national forest down to the protected ocean and it's just a really special place. I guess I didn't really know how special it was though until I moved away to Portland and came back and saw all the potential here. We're uncrowded, we're unspoiled, and we're a little difficult to get to, but my God, once you come here, you fall in love. We just thought if we could pull people to come into this Wild Rivers Coast and stay longer and explore a little farther into our back country, there was a lot of opportunities for them to experience. I think our whole future is at stake here. This area is ready to go, we just need to give it a little kick in the butt. I'm gonna be honest, when the Rural Tourism Studio came here, I was skeptical because I didn't see far enough ahead that we actually could collaborate regionally. And I'm pleasantly surprised, it's been amazing. The Rural Tourism Studios was the first time we were able to come together as a region to talk about the future of our economy. If we can have a strong tourism economy in this area, it's gonna benefit the whole community. 
we have to rely on ourselves. And I think through this program, it's sort of opened our eyes to what we could do when we work together. Community leaders really focused on three areas, outdoor recreation, food and agricultural tourism, and really building community relationships. In our area, a lot of the food that's grown all gets shipped away. And so now we're realizing that we can capture some of that local food that's grown here. The Eat Fresh and Local Action Team has hosted a series of networking events bringing together the area growers with the area vendors so that we could have more local food available to the visitors to our area. And now we're seeing more local food in our grocery stores, in our restaurants, and we have a new local food co-op. We created a farm trail from Bandon to Port Orford. We did nine UPIC farms, and it just gained traction, and people loved it. Langlois is less than 500 people. It's very small. So we have to bring in tourists. And being on the farm trail, even though it's just beginning, has really helped do that. We really want to make it a destination for anybody. My mom and I began Dragonfly Farm just three years ago. When I found out that I could grow a seed and turn that into food, it was like, oh my gosh, why wouldn't you do this? I just quit my, my day job and I just signed the paper to be an official co-owner of the farm. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life and grow with the community. Out of the Outdoor Recreation Action Team, we came up with a series of maps that show where the best places to go recreate are. We know where we're going to send people now, and we got a great map that shows all the best places to go see. For us to get a mapping project done to this extent is pretty impressive. We're patting ourselves on the back. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else is, but we're doing it. From that, we decided that there was some places that needed help, so we came up with a mountain bike plan, and we also worked on designating a state scenic bikeway. The Outdoor Recreation Action Team was also looking at how we can make scuba diving better in this area. So we came up with the idea for a scuba fill station. So now people that want to come and dive in this area, they can dive for multiple days because they can get their tanks filled up again. When I started the Rural Tourism Studio, my business, South Coast Tours, was really small. And now we've grown to about five or six guides. And we're doing tours all over from Brookings all the way up to Coos Bay. Overall, tourism is on the rise here. We've had a bang up last two years, and it's like a breath of fresh air down here. My hope for the area is that we still keep that sense of place. Loving a place to death is a big concern that I have, and it's a balance. We're gonna promote tourism, but we wanna do it in a sustainable way. One of the biggest reasons that this area has been so successful since the tourism studio is the people that are involved. We have a lot of great, motivated, smart people who understand the need to promote tourism in the right way. And it's really all about the people. When you live in a rural community like we do, from Bannon down to Brookings, and you're strapped for cash, relationships are crucial. As a community, I think. All right, we are coming back in to our meeting November 6th. It is now 345, Commissioner Boyce. Wendy Lang, then Will Lawson, then Jackie Antunas, David Fortman. Real quick, Mr. Chair, the reason I brought up the horrible uh, thing that happened in Mexico just is because with open borders, this is where the heroin, this is where the opioids, this is where the fentanyl comes from. And so I just wanted to tie that all together. Thanks for being here, Director Good. Lang. Thanks for having me, Wendy Lang, Curry County Juvenile Department. Um, just going to share some quick trends that we're seeing in this opioid crisis that we're in in the juvenile world. Um, I can tell Lang. you. One second, I'm sorry. 3:46 p.m. on November 6th, we are in session. I got it. Start again. I'm sorry. We have. To, it wasn't recording. No problem. Wendy Lang, Curry County Juvenile Department. I'd like to share some trends that we're seeing in this opioid crisis that we're in. Um, and I do mean that wholeheartedly. <coughs> it is my opinion that it is out of control in the youth in Curry County. Um, our youth, and it is out of control. 
several years ago, we started seeing oxycodone, we started seeing hydrocodone. We would see it uh, in UA results, maybe in backpacks. Uh, one thing about kids is kids like to talk. You ask them questions and they'll tell you what's up. So we get a wealth of information. Um, so we were seeing a wide variety of use, uh, maybe some of it prescribed, most of it not. Um, then we jumped into some codeine, which was the cough medicine. It was the thing the kids called drank and they'd make their little cocktail off the recipe. Um, they would chug flavored cough syrup uh, with a little bit of Sprite or something in it. Um, about a year and a half ago, we started seeing morphine pop into the scene and we started seeing kids with morphine. Uh, they're taking it themselves. They're taking it to school. They're selling it five to 80 bucks a pill, whatever they can get for it. They're trading it. Um, the tough part about kids and prescription drugs or cough syrup that you get off the shelf is they have no fear. They have no fear of something that's prescribed by a doctor. So for them to take somebody else's pills or take grandpa's pills or grandma's pills or whatever they can find, um, they don't have the fear of what's going to happen to them. Um, so the more adults get prescription drugs, the more kids find prescription drugs. Um, we don't see a lot of kids out seeking or going to the doctor uh, for pain to get prescriptions. We see them taking and it's very, very easy for them to get to them. Um, I would love to tell you uh, that since I've been here for about 15 years in the juvenile world, we've not seen heroin in our youth. And I can tell you about six months ago, we now have confirmed heroin use in the youth in our county. And that's not just the kids on our caseload. Um, so, we every day try to figure out what our plan's going to be. This is new to us. This is something that we haven't dealt with in this county. Um, we have outpatient treatment. We have our kids go to Curry Community Health for their outpatient treatment. Curry County does not have intensive outpatient, which is where you would see somebody five times a week. And we do not have residential treatment. For our youth to go to residential treatment, there are two places in this state. One is Roseburg and one's Clearover in Prineville, Oregon. And to get our kid on their list is just about impossible. Um, insurance will do everything in the world to say they don't need it and they'll kick it out. So if you can get a kid on OHP, then we can probably get a kid into residential treatment, I don't know, maybe three months down the road. Um, so we're, again, this, this is a new uh, drug use for us, so we're still trying to figure out what we do. We're doing daily check-ins, we're monitoring, we're monitoring social media. Um, but it's here, and it's here for our youth. Um, what's really tough about the, the <coughs> opioid problem for us is it really has a short half-life. Half-life is how long it stays in their system. So, you know, with, we test a kid and if they've been using marijuana, it can be in their system for 30 to 60 days. These can be out in two days. So for us to be able to UA them and find out that they're using it, it's very difficult find. Uh, they can play the game. They know they get a UA and then they can use because they know they're not gonna get another one in two days. The resources we have to track uh, is very difficult. Um, again, we're working on that every day. We work with Curry Community Health. We work with our partners to try to figure out what we're going to do. Um, the concerns for us, again, it's easy for them to get and it's hard for us to detect. Um, we track social media. We try to figure out how they're doing it. And there's this, you know, kids don't really like to inject. That freaks them out. So they're doing different methods of using their heroin. Most recently in comments we're seeing is everybody hears vaping pens on the news. Well, there's now recipes for vaping heroin. Um, mm. We don't have on the streets in our county, you heard the sheriff say, we don't have the Nick kits anymore. So even in the schools, we're overwhelmed with vaping pens in the schools right now. Like Brookings got a school resource officer and we're, we can't keep up with all the vaping pens he's taken on a daily basis, but we can't test it to know if it's tobacco or marijuana at this point, how in the heck are we gonna ever be able to test it to know if there's heroin in it? Um, we got reports coming in of, you know, the girls in our schools doing favors for heroin. 
Um, this is real. This is Curry County. This is something that I never thought I'd be standing in front of you saying that's with our youth. And we don't have a plan for it right now. We're going day to day to try to figure out what we're going to do um, to help these kids. We, we've got to help them. We've got to help them before they get into the adult world. Um, and we are going to see some criminal behavior from this. We're seeing it right now. Um, it's an expensive habit and it's an addictive habit. We don't have detox. We have treatment, but we don't have detox. Uh, so they're going to do whatever they have to do to get their fix. Uh, I am so glad to hear that you guys are taking information on this um, and asking all of us what's going on because in my department, uh, the op opioid epidemic is real and we are in crisis in the youth in our county. Um, it is everywhere. It's pretty normal to hear police reports of pills falling out of pockets and no, lab no names on them and uh, search kids and it's in their clothes and we are charging every time we get it. We are not charging to criminalize them, we are charging to get them help. Um, and that's the information that I have. Short, Thank you. not so sweet, but uh, any help that we can get in our department is much appreciated. Thank, Thank you, you Director Lang. Will Watson. Good afternoon. My name is Will Watson. I am the suicide prevention quarter, uh, coordinator for the VA Coastal uh, for uh, southern, southern counties uh, from Lane, Coos, Curry to Del Nor. I'm very excited to be here. This is a very passionate, uh, passionate subject to me. Um, and I think it's very interrelated with the conversations that we're having today. So thank you for giving my time today. A um, couple different um, aspects that I wanted to start off with. I really just wanted to um, understand the idea of why suicide prevention and what's the importance behind this. Uh, when I look at this, uh, first aspect for me is it's a national public health concern. Um, so when I think of a national public health concern, I think about conveying that to, to many people, I think of data points um, often. So when I think of data points, uh, when I come to suicide prevention, I think of 10, I think of 45,000, I think of 123, and I think of 12. So it's the 10th, tenth, leading cause for death of all ages in the United States, suicide. Nearly every year, we lose 45,000 Americans to suicide. 123 Americans die every day on average. And every 12 minutes, we lose another American to suicide. And in fact, I think by the time that we started this presentation to where we are now, I think we have lost approximately six people to suicide in our nation. And here in Curry County, it's an even bigger issue. Um, our uh, suicide death rate <coughs> ratio is the highest in the, uh, in the state, and it's high, very high for the country. And so we have a very huge opportunity to, uh, to impact on this. While I work for veterans, and that's the second part of why we have uh, prevention programs, suicide prevention programs, because our veterans are a national, uh, are a main concern for us. Um, this doesn't just center on veterans. It doesn't just center on youth. It doesn't center just on males or other at-risk populations, LGBT including. If we're addressing this for one population, we need to be addressing this for all, and that's my goal. The VA really forms on and functions on the idea of a public health approach using data-driven methods, outcomes, understanding those, and collaborating in federal, state, and local. Uh, the idea behind that is crucial, because if we look at the veteran statistics, on average, there's 20 suicides each day. Six of those veterans are in VA healthcare systems. That's 14 veterans not receiving any VA healthcare benefits. And how do we access them? How do we identify them? And what do we do in those cases? That's the safety net that needs to occur throughout a community. We need to identify what resources and what gaps in those resources are available. When I start thinking about that, there's a few barriers that I think of when I think of um, Curry County, Coos County, in general down on the southern uh, coast in terms of opportunities I think that we have. Um, I certainly think of overall lack of mental health providers. And so what's our area of opportunity? Well, how do we recruit? How do we retain? Are we using federal 
student loan repayment grants that we can offer people to get them to come to these localities? What are our options to get them to be here and to retain them? I just drove all the way across country from Baltimore, Maryland nine months ago to take this job because I care. Uh, local hospitals, is there an APU? To my knowledge, there's not. Do they have mandated emergency beds for those that are acute? To my knowledge, it's not happening. Why? Because we're referring our veterans over to the local hospital, and within two to three hours later, they're released right back into public. So is it they're not adequate space? Are they not doing uh, effective instruments, screenings, uh, evaluations, assessments? I'm not sure, but releasing someone who's acute for suicide right back onto the streets is a recipe for disaster and it's also burning out our staff. So you wanna recruit and retain mental health providers? It's not gonna happen in that way. How do we work better as a system? How do we work better from VA to local hospital back to big VA with APU? Because we have one there and we can, there are transfer alternatives for this. When I think of other areas of opportunities, I think of awareness. Stigma is present. How do we combat that? Well, we talk about it, so thanks for having me here today. I appreciate that. We get out in the community. In Coos County, we've trained over 220 local professionals, residents, cab drivers, uh, bartenders, all sorts of different aspects of community residents, and that's important. And why do I know it is? Because I've had people in, uh, approach me and say, from the training you gave me, which is very simple, it's usually three to four very easy, easy steps, they've been able to feel comfortable and pull from out of that belly of uncomfortableness when they identify someone who's at risk, signs, they identify signs, they know then to ask the question. After they ask the question, they help by listening. Let the person tell their story, especially for our veterans. Don't thank them for their service, let them tell their story. And then what do you do next? You get them to care. You help them understand there is help. Suicide is preventable and then you expedite them to that treatment. That's the SAVE model we use at the VA, and that's the things that we can do out in the community, whether it's that model or a different model, to make awareness happen and make people feel safe to be able to encounter and address those people who are at risk. And I think we can do more of that here, including train the trainers. Let's make some local trainers. Let's have them sign contracts where they're willing to do trainings for the communities thereafter. That's a huge opportunity for us. When I think of the, another huge aspect, I think of lethal means storage. It's not my favorite t topic to have um, because I, I feel a lot of resistance, and I understand that. My dad is a gun owner, he's a big hunter, all those great things, but we're not talking that. What we're talking is lethal, lethality behind gun use for suicide is at an all-time rate, and in fact, in 2017, 70.7 of male veteran suicides and 43.2 of female veteran suicides were due to firearms. The aspect of suicide is usually an acute moment that if we can help them ride that moment and not act on that pulsivity by safe gun storage, gun locks, not only could they save themselves in that moment, but they're gonna save <coughs> the kid who accidentally identified the gun and located it as well. That's a huge opportunity. What can we do? Can we partner with local stores, gun stores, local associations? Let's not make this from uh, an enforcement aspect. Let's get a buy-in part, especially with the people they're more likely to interact with at the local stores from who they buy the gun from. I think it's an area of opportunity. When I think of um, other opportunities, I think of faith-based initiatives. Why not getting a faith-based hub going? Identifying the local pastors asking to train them in these suicide prevention aspects, seeing if we can get their congregation trained. How about having them promote mental health resources after we develop a cumulative list that is needed? Let's have them help us move the needle, okay? I think of primary care. Are they doing the screenings? Do they know about the Columbia Suicide Risk Severity Rating Scale? It is an evidence-based questionnaire scale that you can do with a patient that's eight questions. It weeds out ideation from intent from action. That is huge and it's an opportunity for us truly to identify the, those that are in need. Are they utilizing those? Do they know what to do if there is a, if, if, if they do have someone acute? I think of postvention. 
135 people are impacted by every single suicide that occurs. A mother, a father, a post office, the barista, the doctor, and don't forget the doctors and the therapists, because that's a whole nother realm of people that we need to be focusing in on when there's a death of, of suicide, because that increases their burnout. So I think that's a huge area of opportunity. And I want to make sure that I do uh, address the other little aspect that I heard today. Um, I was the former director, clinical director of an HIV prevention and treatment program. We had a behavioral health program there with opioid maintenance therapy, uh, therapy provided in Suboxone. We also had outpatient standard modality. We had in in intensive outpatient st standard modality, and we had re ability to refer to inpatient. One thing I can say on that, no systematic approach to stopping opioid is going to work. Work with individuals on an individual level. I understand the need to, to decrease the levels that are being prescribed, absolutely, but we need to meet people where they're at as well, because otherwise they're out on the streets buying it and they're getting the fentanyl version, or they're calling the, calling the veteran crisis line and reporting suicide or um, they're identifying that that's their next step because no one is meeting them where they're at. They were not educated. They were not provided understanding of alternatives. You don't just tell a veteran to go get acupuncture or try, try, some, try some Tai Chi or yoga. You do that as you're tapering them down and you're educating them and you have them access those services at the same time. Plus there's tools to show that they actually do work, but they are not gonna buy that unless you show them to the water and help them understand that it's drinkable water. So I think this is just uh, quite a few different uh, areas of opportunity. I look forward to working with everyone here to see how we can uh, move the needle further on this. Thank, Thank you for sir. making the trip down here, Mr. Watson. My pleasure. Jackie Antunas. Jackie Antunas, I'm the executive director of Wally's House. It's our county's child abuse intervention center. When Commissioner Boyce asked me to speak to this crisis, I had to think long and hard about what I had to contribute in the information that I have. And I've sat here and I've listened to all our community partners that have accepted the invitation and, and spoken to the issue that's in front of us. And I have to underline uh, Director Lang's cry. I worked for the juvenile department. I've seen things increase when I was there. And what she's dealing with now has to absolutely be a frustrating nightmare. I don't know what, what a night's sleep looks like for her when she has to think about what she has to face at work. As the executive director of a child abuse intervention center. The <clears throat> cases that I see and that I deal with are because I've been asked by the Department of Human Services and law enforcement to conduct a forensic interview of a child where there's uh, allegations of abuse or sus suspected abuse. Maybe the child themselves has made a disclosure to someone and it's been reported. We've had some cases where I can say definitely support uh, what, the, what the district attorney has said about methamphetamine, children who are severely neglected and, um, I mean, the dental neglect, the, the children who are, who are the oldest sibling and they're scrounging around trying to find food for younger siblings. Maybe nobody has physically abused them, but I can tell you that the most under-addressed and highest type of abuse is neglect in our, in our county, in our state, and in our country. Um, it's, it's finally taking root and being addressed more and more, but um, it's, it's horrific because mom and dad are, are off seeking drugs whether they're methamphetamine, heroin, opi opioids, um, it's, it's an issue. The children that I see are not as, at, as high a rate as um, 
Mona Chandler said on her CASA list, sometimes it doesn't require a forensic interview. Sometimes DHS can walk in and take custody of those children and start a peti uh, dependency petition and those children may be nonverbal or there may be, um, they may be too young for, for us to conduct an interview. I just completed my, my VOCA um, grant application report for the last federal fiscal year. Um, I actually, that report get, went from October 1st of 2018 to September 30th of this year, 2019. And we saw 48 children in our center during that particular round of months. Um, again, we have less than 3,000 children in our, in our county under the age of 18. So I think it's a low number in some aspects. In other aspects, it's, it's atrocious that we had to see that many children in our center. Um, some of them were siblings. Some of them were single cases. Some of them were sexually abused. Some of them were just, it was about neglect. Mom and dad seeking drugs and the oldest child trying to figure out some way to um, to find food within in that house or call relatives and say, can you bring us something? And when the relative shows up, there's um, animal feces around the house and there's dirty dishes all over the kitchen and, there, and it, there's nothing to eat in the home. Or if there's food, it's spoiled. So like Director Lang, I'm gonna make it short and I'm sorry, it's, it's so negative but we have to address these issues. Um, when <coughs> Ms. Chandler spoke of funding, our grant, our funding comes mostly from grants from the state and federal government. We have a few foundation grants and what funding we do get from the state is at 17%. So we have mandated services like Ms. Chandler and the funding that we're getting for those mandated services doesn't even meet the need that we have people saying, oh, I'd like to give you money, but I want it to go directly to the, to the clients or to the children. That's fine. We will be ha we're happy to make sure that there are teddy bears, quilts, snacks, drinks for the children. But what best serves those children is having staff in place and making sure that referrals are made to our community partners. We can make referrals for um, mental health services. We can make referrals for following up with doing the medical exams we need to that we can't get done in the center. Um, I'm sorry. It's okay, Jack. The need is so huge for for everything, everyone. I'm hearing the cry for people that that need suicide prevention. Another case that I just dealt with was getting a referral on a teenager who was suicidal and and had overdosed on heroin. So it's it's there. I don't see as much as these people that are here uh, crying out for more services and more ways to bring <coughs> services into our community but I know that it's there. I talk to them and I deal with just a small fraction of what they do. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Forbman, thank uh, you. Last but certainly not least, sir. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Boyce and commissioners for having this hearing. After spending 34 years in law enforcement coming to this job, let me just give you another perspective to the opiate problems in Curry County. For those of us who don't believe that we have anybody in our family with these problems, all you do is look at your neighbor and look at some of the problems that we have here. As I'm sitting here listening to the stories, I'm thinking about, well, in the last seven days, what have you done that has been involved in drugs and in my field? Thursday, went to a home where they, I'll call her the grandmother, was on severe pain medications, a hoarder, six foot piles of stuff that collapsed on the responders that coming in, trapping everybody in the house. 
Her son lives downstairs. He's not as bad of a hoarder. He's got four foot piles hmm. of stuff. On Friday, it was a dog bites between transients and a, and a citizen involving drugs. Obviously, we're there. Saturday, I got called out for a neighbor dispute that the neighbors next door with all the trash and all the animals were now burning things and they could smell the sewage and they were suspecting that it was methamphetamine. So both the sheriff and I had to go out on that. On Saturday, um, <coughs> Sunday, got a call for uh, a dog at large down at the port menacing people, a pit bull which turned out to be a transient that was encamped out on Winchuck Road, who then moved into one of the port storage buildings. Okay. On Monday, followed up on a complaint from Saturday that I didn't go out to, and the little walkway that everybody uses to go up from Lower Harbor Road to get on the other side of the bridge had a little camp in it there. And as I'm cleaning up the encampment, I'm running into syringes and needles every day. On Tuesday, I'm responding to a call referred by the Sheriff's Department of people living in their RVs out in the, in the booms. And every RV call that I go to is full of syringes, full of drugs, all the problems. They're not only being used as a residence, they're being used to, to manufacture drugs, to sell the drugs. On Wednesday night, last night, I got a call for an encampment fire from the Sheriff's Department doing a great job. Who's, the fire is across the street from a person who was dying of cancer who is complaining every day about the transients across the street and the, and the smells that are coming from. So these are all issues that are affecting all of us. The needles, the residents, the encampments, the dogs, um, last week I was at a, another property where nine people were living in a two-bedroom house. Again, the drugs are there. When I walk on the properties, much like law enforcement sees, I see either manic people, and I know which drug they're on, and I see people who are very sedate and calm. But then they have the five, six-foot piles of garbage and the overflowing sewage. I can tell you in every one of your neighbors and near some of your own homes, there's squats, there's wasted apartment, uh, wasted property where the drug users bring their drugs there. And right off of Cape Farrella, for example, I was at um, last week, three foot piles of garbage that I'm crawling over the top of trying to get into. And when I get into it, I see the prescription bottles, the needles and all that. And that's where the people are bringing their drugs to do, they can't do. Some of our old fam famous residents, uh, old time residents down in South County, same thing, I've been abandoned and the drugs are being used. Other places I'm finding encampments, the people who have moved in with their RVs and are just doing the drugs next to each other and cooking and sharing and all that. So I'll end mine shortly by saying this is not just a problem of a family. It's not just a problem of an individual or a service that's providing to the county. It's a problem of all of us. It lives next door to you. Okay. And if you are not afraid of that trash and those things next door to you, that first house that I went to with the, the hoarder that got uh, the first responders got into, all their stuffs are piled on top of electrical cords and everything's running in their house. And they're on a hill with grass. In a, in a valley that's just going to burn down. Or, is it, or in, they're in an old trailer park, our 30, 40 year old trailer parks in Harbor that will just go one fire to another and go up. So it's a problem that needs to be addressed. It needs to be addressed on the human level, but it needs to be addressed on the institution and on society level. And we all need to recognize it's not, well, we don't have any drug problems in our family you got a drug problem in your community. Any questions I can answer for you? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Commissioner Boyce, you have something to finish with? Just, uh, I'm going to process all. I uh, absolutely love every person that spoke here today. I knew I was going to learn a lot, uh, but the level of 
of uh, information, the frustration, the concern, the hearts. Um, <coughs> mighty, mighty powerful. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Gold, do you have a closing comment? Uh, just that I learned a whole lot. Um, it's unfortunate that we have a lot of these problems, and hopefully we can move forward to actually do something about the problems. I don't. I think it's going to have to be a whole community effort, not just commissioners. I want to say when I grew up as a kid, um, I, you know, we grew up around our siblings, and I had a sister of mine that ended up going in the army, and after she got out of the army, she became an RN and ran a crash unit for pediatrics for 26 years. And I used to sit back and say, that little, my little sister, she really turned into all that. And what I want to say, the reason I bring that up is because all of you are her to me. You're all heroes. Because you deal with a part of our society that nobody really wants to deal with. To have people to come in and willingly give back to the youth of this nation you're our heroes. Have people willing to run into bullets that are being fired at them. Those are heroes. And I want to say from this board's stand, thank you all for doing what you do. Thank you for sharing with us today. And we will move this forward. So thank you for being here. And with nothing further, this meeting is adjourned.